Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. Uh, it's January 17th, 2019. I'm here at the Nicholson Library at Linfield College. We're here with Mark Chen. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to start you off, Mark, by asking you, why wine? Oh, why wine? Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> I could take up the whole interview. <laughs> um, let's see, I grew up in an academic family in New England. Um, my father was a polymer chemist at the University of Massachusetts. and. Uh, I knew, did not know of wine uh, for my first uh, 18 years. Uh, we didn't drink wine in our family, um, but then my father got a sabbatical leave to spend a year in uh, Munich, Germany. It just so happened that some of his uh, colleagues uh, lived in the wine areas of Germany, in particular um, uh, along the Rheingau section. And so we would go up there and um, and I just fell in love with walking through the vineyards. And uh, um, I returned back there twice to stay with the family that he knew and spent sum summers there. Mm -hmm. And again, just walking through the vineyards. And uh, even though I didn't like to, still didn't like to really drink wine at that time, I just loved being among the vines and, mm -hmm. and the culture and uh, um, the ambiance of the, uh, of the villages in the Rheingau, and uh, I think that's where I got started. Then I started undergraduate at Amherst College in uh, Massachusetts, uh, was a psych major, um, but as I spent more time in Europe, I spent about three years in Europe, all told, between high school and college, uh, including a year abroad. Um, I kind of, that's where I got the wine bug. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was fully intending to uh, do psychology, but uh, um, then just wanted to explore the wine and asked everybody, where do you go to learn about grapes and wine? And they all said, uh, go west, young man, to this place called UC Davis. So, so out I went there with no science background and uh, I went to the graduate dean of faculty and said, here I am, I'm ready to study viticulture. <laughs> and he looked at my transcript and said, go away, you're not qualified. <laughs> so I spent uh, a summer and a semester doing coursework in, sci in the sciences so I could uh, get into the viticulture enology program. And that was the launch of me and wine. That's amazing. So after you got into UC Davis, uh, how did you sort of figure out your path forward from there, what, what you wanted to study and then what you wanted to do with that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It was always about the vineyard from the very start. It was not about wine. So at, at UC Davis, um, uh, there were really two camps. There were the winemakers, the people who aspired to that, and the, the grape growers. Um, I always just wanted to be in the vineyard. I took, I think, one enology uh, class. Um, uh, the best class I took there was uh, a tractor driving class for ag majors and and the one of the coolest moments in my life was uh, you just they take you out into this big open field and they have every tractor known to man there and they would put you on a d6 and give you like 30 seconds of instructions and say okay go out in that field and do your thing and uh, that was uh, that was just great but um, yeah I wanted to learn about viticulture it became very clear when I was there that um, I wasn't going to learn very much about uh, uh, the practical aspects of uh, growing wine grapes. I considered transferring to Fresno, which it, at that time, uh, even before Cal Poly really had a reputation, was the place to go if you wanted hands-on knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but I made a, I worked down at the research station in Kearney for a, a little while, and um, I decided uh, I couldn't live. Uh, in the Central Valley that I, w I would probably die before um, I graduated because it is so hot. Over 100 degrees in the shade of the vine. And uh, these were vines, these are Thompson seedless vines that were producing 10 to 15 tons per acre. Oh my gosh. Uh, so I stuck with Davis. I worked at the uh, uh, research vineyard. So my really formative experience uh, just in terms of practical learning was uh, working at the uh, research vineyard uh, both in Oakville and at Davis. And so I worked with a largely uh, Hispanic crew and uh, it, was, it was just terrific. And I also spent weekends working at a small winery in the Amador Foothill 
uh, Foothill area mm -hmm. called Amador Foothill Winery uh, for Ben and Joan Zeitman. And that was my hands-on experience uh, planting vines and making wine. Um, what, probably my most memorable wine making experience was uh, Ben told me to go clean a, a red open top redwood tank and gave me a bucket of uh, metal bisulfide and a scrub brush and I went in the tank and started scrubbing away and um, I'm highly asthmatic so that was not a, a good combination and I end up barely getting out of that tank with my life. I kind of crawled out of it and just slopped on the floor. So that was a good um, experience for me in terms of industrial safety. So I've been much more cautious uh, ever since. But Davis was great. Uh, you know, I all say that Davis is good, uh, a place to learn why grapes grow, not necessarily how to grow grapes. So um, yeah, if you want to do the how to, there are other places where you can perhaps do a, uh, a, a little bit better. But I met some outstanding people at Davis, so um, that's where you really uh, do your first networking and, mm -hmm. and making connections. And probably most importantly, I learned about the cooperative extension system at Davis. Uh, the um, extension viticulturist was a legendary person named Amon Kazimatis, or Kaz, we all called him. And uh, he was my resource for practical knowledge. Kaz was out in the field. He, was, he knew every grower in the state at that time. And um, uh, um, if you had a question about um, uh, plant physiology or why grapes grow or how to plant a vine or how to, um, uh, how to um, uh, um, do anything in terms of management practices, Kaz would be the person, person to ask. Mm -hmm. So that was a story from Davis. Sure. Uh, so from Davis, how did you end up in Oregon? Uh, okay. Uh, so my, I'm from New England, and it was always my intention to go back to New England to, um, uh, to work. So uh, um, actually two quarters before I was supposed to get my master's, uh, a job came up uh, on Long Island. Long Island on the North Fork. There's a, a small but very high quality wine region there. Mm -hmm at uh, a vineyard named Pindar. And uh, so I called up the uh, owner, he was a cardiologist. Uh, um, at that time, everybody just assumed that anybody who graduated from Davis in viticulture and oology knew everything there was uh, to know about how to grow grapes and make wine. So Pindar at that time was and still is the largest winery and vineyard uh, on Long Island. Uh, so I packed up my bags and went back across the country and um, my wife and I, my wife Judy and I got married and uh, we set up camp uh, in on the North Fork of Long Island. So I worked there for uh, three years and that was a great experience. We had a hundred and over a hundred uh, acres of grapes and 20 different varieties including table grapes, uh, hybrids, uh, vinifera. Um, we had no clue what we were doing. Of course, uh, the owner uh, figured out after a year that he couldn't sell the grapes. You know, he had planted too many. So uh, in, I think, August, he said, well, uh, Mark, we're going to uh, start a winery. And uh, so we took an old potato barn and converted it into a uh, winery. And he informed me that I was going to be the winemaker, even though I had never made a <laughs> drop of wine in my entire life. Uh, that, first ga that first year I made 7,000 gallons of wine. In the second year I made 35,000 gallons of wine. And this is again, just this continuing extension story was uh, where I really get, gained an appreciation for extension because uh, the extension enologist in New York at that time was uh, Dr. Tom Cottrell up in, uh, uh, at Cornell in Ithaca. And I spent probably an hour every day during m that first harvest and subsequent harvest uh, talking to Tom, uh, learning how to make wine on the phone and by reading uh, Dr. Vine, Richard Vine's book, uh, um, I think, uh, Commercial uh, Wine Production. And, uh, and actually, we made some pretty non-disastrous wines. <laughs> So uh, that was the launch of, of uh, wines at Pindar Vineyard. So I spent three years on Long Island uh, working with uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension and at that time, small group of, of winemakers very, very much like the early days in uh, Oregon, um, uh, um, just trying to figure out 
what grows best, where and why. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will have to say, I've done, I've done that process of working in emerging wine regions uh, on Long Island, in uh, Oregon, and um, the Mid-Atlantic, and that is by far the most fun, the most interesting, the most en uh, adventurous period in any wine industry. So um, having done that in the 80s and 90s here in Oregon, and then going away for 15 years, uh, and doing it again in the mid-Atlantic region and then coming back here when Oregon is very much settled and established It's just a completely different industry and completely different uh, uh, Feeling but uh, I really enjoyed our days of discovery here when every day you got up and you were scratching your head and trying to figure out how are we going to make decent wine mm -hmm. and uh, more particular in the Willamette Valley uh, outstanding Pinot Noir that the world would uh, gain uh, um, respect and um, appreciation for. Sure, sure. So, what got you out of Long Island and and, and back into the back to the West? Oh, it's all you know, you know. Everything's about networking these days. So, um, let's see. My wife uh, um, was a German professor at Amherst College, and uh, I lived in Amherst and was a student at Amherst College and um, and. Dr. Uh, Eddie Koo, who is uh, currently a neuropathologist at the uh, University of California at San Diego, uh, focusing on Alzheimer's. Uh, um, his family bought a vineyard in uh, the Willamette Valley and uh, named it Temperance Hill. So they were part of the original Winkwiss and Seely uh, gang of thieves. Um, who uh, and, and airline pilots <laughs> who started all of these uh, uh, wide space hanging Charles vineyards in the middle of the Willamette Valley, mostly in the Eola Hills, and that includes Seven Springs and Freedom Hill mm -hmm. and Carter, I believe, uh, um, and Flynn, and uh, some of the really great established names. I mean, these were not traditional uh, vineyards at all, uh, um, but they produce great wine and maybe I can return a little bit later to um, how those vineyards were evaluated by OSU. Um, but so Eddie visited us when I was uh, on the North Fork at Pindar and then um, when he decided uh, that Winkwiss and Seeley were no longer needed, uh, he asked me if I would come out and take care of Temperance Hill. So that was in 1985. I do remember <laughs> in the fall of 84 uh, he invited uh, Judy and uh, me to come out and uh, visit Temperance Hill. And so we had a three-day visit. And I remember from the moment we stepped off the plane to the moment we got back on the plane, it rained torrentially for the entire three days. And I remember on the plane, we're just looking at each other and saying, can we do this? <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. But we ended up coming out in June of, uh, uh, I think June of 20. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, 1985, yeah. And uh, I started at Temperance Hill, uh, and uh, it was very clear that Temperance Hill uh, was a high elevation site, that, that it was going to be a low yield, high quality site. Uh, so from the very beginning, that, uh, that was the focus, um, high quality uh, wine from uh, Temperance Hill. Uh, the Coos never wanted to have a winery, still do not have one, but they always wanted to sell to the best producers possible, and so um, we just uh, tried to cultivate relationships with, uh, at that time in the early 80s, uh, set uh, um, some of the best wineries around the valley. Sure. So tell me a little bit about your initial impressions of the Oregon industry once you got here and, and started working at, at Temperance Hill. What were your impressions of the others around you and the potential of the industry. Yeah. So probably the best thing that's happened in my wine career is that I happened to end up as neighbors uh, of the Castiles at Bethel Heights. <laughs> First of all, it took me about five years to tell Ted and Terry apart. Um, you know, we would meet at the fence and I, I, they'd be talking and I wanted to listen, but I'm too busy scratching my head trying to figure out who was who. And that was, a, that was a real problem. Finally, thank God, uh, uh, Ted grew a beard, and that saved us all. <laughs> so then we knew which was which. But uh, Bethel Heights was just, uh, if, if there was a kind of center of the 
Oregon wine universe in its formative years, I would say it was Bethel Heights. Between Ted, Terry, uh, Pat, and Marilyn, um, uh, they were just involved in every aspect of the wine industry. Of course, there were, there were many others who are now um, ensconced in the ar archives here, but um, you know, just talking across the fence with, with all of them uh, kept me centered on everything that was going on in the Oregon wine universe. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, it was just an incredible learning process. Uh, at, at, in the early days, uh, we didn't have that much grapes, so the harvest was over. Uh, I think when I got there, there was maybe 60 or 70 acres of grapes, which was large by Oregon standards. We didn't have that many grapes because the vines were young, so I, um, uh, we would finish harvest and I would go up and work at Sokol Blosser uh, for the crush and help. And I was there, I'm gonna tell this story, sorry Roland, but you've probably forgotten this. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I was there the first year Roland uh, was making wine at Sokol Blosser uh, with Brian Crozier for Argyle. And he just had these crazy ideas, like all the fermenters were covered, and he was doing kind of a weird carbonic maceration, Pinot Noir style. But I remember once we were crushing uh, Soko Blosser Riesling, uh, Riesling, and so we were down in that hole that they used to have where the press was. I mean, it was a pit dug into the ground, terrible design. <laughs> so the grapes would go in the press, and it was an old Wilma's press with the uh, swing open doors, and so. There were two of us, and, and one was always in charge for making sure that the doors, that it, it locked uh, by a bar that went through these threaded uh, doors. And uh, so Rollin uh, was in charge of securing the doors, and, and uh, the first turn of the press, uh, one of the doors swung open, and I'll tell you, this five-ton Wilma's press emptied in about 15 seconds all the must went right into that pit. And so we spent about the next hour with buckets, uh, bucket, bucketing the uh, grapes back into the press. <laughs> um, uh, I just had great experiences. Uh, I know you, you're doing these archives for stories, but one other quick story is I was in the cellar and I didn't know, even though I made wine at uh, Pindar, uh, Bob McRitchie asked me to transfer some lees uh, from one tank to another and uh, and and we're doing that through a three inch hose and um, uh, so I hook up the hoses and um, switch on the pump and and there's this kind of funny sound and I don't n know how many of you have been in the cellar of a Soko Blosser but there's it's like a huge bunker and there's uh, the workspace below and then there's a stairway on the side of the wall up through a door and then kitty corner to that was Bob's office well, there was a loud bang and a stream of leaves went up 20 feet through that door, kitty corner, right through the angle, which, you know, with that angle, it probably had to be only about three feet of tolerance, right onto Bob's desk. <laughs> and it was just the most miraculous thing. And uh, needless to say, I wasn't fired, but I was reprimanded, and, uh, um, but Bob and I stayed friends for uh, forever. So. Uh, those are some of my early formative experience. I also should note, and I don't know if anyone else has mentioned this, that in the 80s, um, uh, we were making really bad uh, Pinot Noir still wine. Uh, in fact, uh, up until like the early 90s or late 80s, most of the Pinot Noir grapes grown in the Willamette Valley were being uh, process into sweet blush wines. That was what people could sell. So if you think of Schaefer and uh, and a few other notables, uh, they just sold boat lo loads of sweet wine. Then there were these events, most notably Steamboat, uh, that helped. And also the monthly viticulture enology tech group meetings in the back room at Nick's that allowed people to put their minds together and figure out how to make uh, um, decent wine. Mm -hmm. And then just something happened in the early 90s where um, all of this winemaking uh, uh, knowledge and experience came together and really, really good wine started popping out. Um, as I remember, Matt Kramer, who was a wine writer for the Oregonian, uh, wouldn't give us the time of day. Um, it was really in my memory, the, uh, res the, the more adventurous restaurant tours in Portland, and they weren't even sommeliers at that time, they were just restaurant tours who really took an interest in Oregon wine, started putting them 
on their list and I think that's where the first traction at least in terms of consumer uh, recognition uh, um, started to happen but it was really uh, just the focus of trying to make high quality red still wine. Of course 83 was the first vintage when um, I believe Sokol Blosser and, and Yamhill Valley Vineyard wines uh, were called out by Robert Parker as um, two um, uh, Pinot Noir still wines of achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, the very interesting story behind that was those were uh, two different wineries, but the grapes from those wines, as I recall, came from the same vineyard. And um, uh, they were given different scores, uh, high scores, but different scores, but both were um, considered um, early achievements uh, um, uh, for Oregon wine. So that was 83, and then 84 was like the first vintage from hell for the Willamette Valley. That was the year Bethel Heights got started, and I always felt very sorry for Ted and Terry, but they overcame that. 85 was another good vintage, and so uh, um, there was this traction that began to um, uh, um, get established. Uh, and one thing we learned from 84 is you never go to the press and say, wow, we just had a really crappy vintage. <laughs> um, we learned about uh, wordsmithing and semantics after um, uh, the 84 vintage. So now we only have challenging and interesting vintages. Um, uh, and, um, but the press will always figure out uh, um, what really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but those early years were just great. Steamboat was fantastic. Um, Steamboat started as this little Oregon thing uh, by Stephen Carey and David Adelsheim. And it used to be just this small group of Oregonians. And Ted and, and I were often the only grape growers there. Um, but the whole idea of asking people to bring their bad wines, not their showcase wines, and that we we're going to blind taste these and figure out what the heck was wrong, mm -hmm. what went wrong, what we could do about it, and how we could keep it from happening again, was just the most perfect formula for advancing knowledge uh, rapidly. And uh, very shortly after that, well, I don't know how many years it took, you'd have to ask David or, um, well, uh, Stephen knew. Uh, um, then it was like the Californians started coming up, then the French started coming over, then the New Zealanders, then the Germans, and um, uh, it became, then it became this international thing that got tied with IPNC. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole, the uh, nature of the event changed, but not the event itself. So. The Oregonians became the hosts. We could no longer stay in the lo lovely rooms at Steamboat Inn. Uh, we got kicked out to the camping grounds um, in tents because the uh, Europeans had to have uh, uh, luxurious accommodations. <laughs> uh, Pat Lee made us beautiful meals. Um, and that learning process was incredible. I remember once staying in an RV with uh, Bob McRitchie, who was very much a technologically driven uh, winemaker and Randall Graham from Bonnie Dune, who at that time was probably among the m the most uh, ardent uh, uh, of natural winemakers, and they argued for about three hours during the night about the uh, relative merits of filtration versus <laughs> unfiltered wines, and it was one of the most interesting discussions that I'd ever ever heard. We all wanted to go to sleep because we had to get up and taste wines next morning, but um, they argued uh, deep into the night uh, about this. And th that was the kind of thing that was going on at, in Oregon at that time. I mean, we're talking about basic stuff, but stuff that would lead to really um, the consistency and quality, I think, that, um, that we enjoy today. Sure. So I was really, really glad um, to be a part of that, uh, of that period. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I think um, OSU was always a really important part of that um, uh, and um, contributed to all of this knowledge advancement. So before we go to Oregon State, let's talk a little bit about some of the other uh, sort of things you were involved with in Oregon, like uh, founding of Live, uh, working at, at, at Chemeketa. Sort of how did those sort of things come about, and what was your role and, and interest uh, in, in those kind of organizations? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it was always important to me to, you know, uh, 
I won't even use the term give back because um, I just would say at that time anyway, just be involved uh, outside of just uh, uh, trying to figure out on a daily basis uh, how the heck to grow grapes. Um, I guess I was just fortunate to be in the, uh, uh, in the right crowd, so, and, and, and to a large extent, the right crowd was the Castiles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, live started with, I think, five or six of us meeting in, a, in the Bethel Heights tasting room, and uh, Ted and Al McDonald and Dick Daniel and myself, um, uh, sorry for whoever I left out, maybe Dan Duche, um, had this vision that uh, um, uh, we were already farming pretty sustainably, but was there a way we could codif codify our um, practices and actually improve and enhance them? So uh, that's where the whole idea for live kind of got started. And then when Carmo Candolfi came on uh, with her connections in Switzerland and the OIBC, I think, um, uh, so that allowed uh, um, live to become a formal organization. Mm -hmm. um, it was the same thing with Chemeketa. I don't know, I think, uh, so Lowell Ford and Ted and, and some others and Al McDonald um, and me, and we just got together and said, hey, industry's growing. Uh, o OSU was training some pe people, but you know, a uh, uh, four year land grant university mission is very different mm -hmm. from uh, from the boots on the ground uh, needs of a, of a vineyard for uh, people with practical skills. So, um, uh, so we, while well, Lowell was of course uh, important it, at a person at Chemeketa, as was Craig Anderson, who was I believe the head of the horticulture department at that time. So working with them, uh, we did uh, curriculum development for viticulture and enology. And, and launch this program. That was just about the time I was uh, leaving for Pennsylvania, so I never saw that through. I was just in that uh, first formative parts where uh, Steve Krebs from uh, Napa Valley Community College uh, came up to uh, Salem a couple times to help uh, um, advise us on how to start uh, a uh, vocational v and &E program. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole thing happened with uh, a Northwest Viticulture Center at Eola and, and that whole remarkable program that uh, uh, Jesse Sandrock now um, manages mm -hmm. and, um, and that just does so much uh, for the Oregon wine industry. Uh, um, so there was the Oregon Wine Growers Association then and the research committee uh, which was very important and so part of, part of the remarkable thing then was that Bill Nelson and a few others had this vision for uh, creating a marketing and research, uh, a sustainable marketing and research uh, 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 fund through the uh, grape tax. And even though it's just a teensy amount of money, uh, now it's over $2 million. So, um, and to a large extent, uh, uh, research and marketing and promotion funded through that uh, uh, program has uh, really helped to drive uh, Oregon uh, into the uh, uh, kind of uh, um, world of wine. Um, and then the precursor to the Oregon Wine Symposium was the viticulture uh, session to the Oregon Horticulture Society show every January. Uh, in fact, I just got a message from Greg uh, Jones yesterday that he's going up there. So that's part of the Northwest Ag Show, mm -hmm. um, which is where you know you would go and uh, um, uh, look at tractors and dream. <laughs> 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 uh, but we also had a day-long uh, uh, Oregon Oregon uh, uh, um, viticulture session, and for me that was great. So David let brought in Pinot Gris, and. So we're scratching our heads and saying, okay, well, Pinot Gris, this is interesting. How do we grow this? So we went to uh, Alsace and got uh, Alex Schaefer from, uh, uh, from INRA, uh, which is the French version of the uh, USDA. And he came over in, was it 19, uh, 1989 or something like that? And, gave talks and toured around um, to teach people you know, how they grow Pinot Gris uh, uh, um, 
in Alsace. And uh, for me personally, that was a wonderful uh, experience because I was on the committee that brought him over and he came over again later on with his wife in another year and we toured around Oregon uh, with them. And then uh, this is one of those serendipitous things that happened. So one day I'm in the office at Temperance Hill and uh, if you can call, even call it that, it was kind of <laughs> like a storage shed. Um, and out of the fax machine uh, comes this piece of paper and it's a message from Alex and he, he said, hey Mark, why don't you come over to Paris and be a judge in this wine competition? So I write back to, um, I think we even did have email in that time. Uh, I write back to Alex and said, well, Alex, you know, I'd love to come to Paris, but I've never judged uh, any kind of wine competition in my, my entire life. So I send that back and another fax arrives, hey, don't worry about it, just come over and have fun. <laughs> so that led me to uh, uh, visiting Paris six times um, as a judge for uh, Vino Lise. And uh, I think some Oregon wines were awarded medals and, and did quite nicely. Actually, some Pennsylvania wines did also, but it's just a good example of how networking can lead to interesting and uh, um, uh, fun experiences. Mm -hmm. So I get to go to Paris. I, admittedly, it was in February, but, uh, <laughs> and then after the competition, which lasted four days, they would have a three-day tour for the non-French wine judges where they would take us on a gu personally guided tour to a different wine region in France. And, and that's where I have made some of my best connections and friendships is starting through, uh, through those wine tours. That's amazing. So, and you know, I actually learned to become a pretty good judge. It was a little bit difficult with the language thing because of course, you know, French was m most often the language at the table, so I, I knew enough German to get by, so I'd have to have somebody translate German into French. Um, so, but it, it, I think it all worked out at the end. It probably was completely unfair to the uh, people who submitted wines, but uh, <laughs> 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 it was a great experience. And you were also here just as IPNC was getting off the ground, and I know you were part of that uh, board at, at one point. So tell me a little about IPNC and what you remember about it getting started. Yeah, well, you know, I think, again, but is that, that's probably Pat Dudley and, and David Adelsheim. Boy, those two. <laughs> um, I mean, who would, ha who would have known uh, that it would evolve into what, what it is today? Um, but, uh, yeah, I think... Um, so Joni Weatherspoon from Seven Springs was the uh, chair at that time. I can't remember, I think this preceded Amy Wesselman even, and I, I don't know who the full-time person was, uh, but uh, they asked me to be, be on the uh, uh, board, and, and that was great. Again, it was just one of those things that you do to uh, contribute to the, to the effort. And, um, you know, I didn't really know that much about wine. I was a grower, I'm probably the token grower on the, uh, on the board. Um, but uh, but uh, I ended up being in charge of the wine room, so, which was a really important, that's a really important uh, kind of technical piece of the whole event is that you have the hundreds of wines and you just have to make sure the right wines are in, in the right place. And there's actually quite a large staff that uh, does that, but uh, the whole pl it was very interesting the whole planning process to make sure that there was a successful IPNC and, and when it reached the point where it was so popular then it had to go to a lottery mm -hmm. system and sort of managing people's uh, expectations that there were these people who had been coming you know uh, since the first year and that there was this expectation that they would always be able to come if they chose to do so and uh, things like that I didn't I didn't envy Joni for having to uh, uh, deal with a lot of those issues, but um, yeah, it was a major schmooze event. Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't technical like Steamboat, but mm -hmm. it served a completely different purpose and, and an equally important one. I mean, of course, you had to make the good wine so that they could be poured at IPNC so people, you know, would come back and, mm -hmm. and, and tell their friends about it. But uh, it just showed the kind of marketing just really creative, visionary, marketing, technical uh, um, uh, skill that many of the early people in the Oregon wine industry had that they would come up with an event like Steamboat and IP and C and Oregon Pinot Camp. Mm -hmm. um, these are really just brilliant ideas. And when I did go to P 
Penn State. Um, I took all of these ideas with me and I said, okay, uh, you know, uh, of all the wine regions in the world that I've ever known about, um, certainly in the new world, I would say nobody, maybe Washington would be the only comparison, but uh, not even California uh, could we say that there was uh, sort of brilliant, um, uh, brilliant, coordinated leadership from the start that people had this vision, they knew exactly what they wanted. Of course, with Oregon, it was always kind of a little bit easy because it was always about Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And I do not say this uh, to slight the other great wine regions in Oregon, but in the early years, uh, it was always about Pinot Noir. Um, then, to some extent, Pinot Gris. Uh, Chardonnay flunked because uh, of uh, the 108 clone, but now it's uh, come, come back like gangbusters. But those visionary leaders, even for David Lett to think that Pinot Gris would find a home in Oregon was, you know, I don't know. I never asked him, you know, how he came up with that. Was it just like this bolt of lightning in the night or something like that? <laughs> but, um, but once you do come up with that idea, there's a whole sequence of events that you have to go through in order to establish a successful variety and that, that Oregon was able to do that uh, with uh, Pinot Noir and then Pinot Gris and now once again with Chardonnay is just a testimony to not only the ter determination, but I think the sheer creativity mm -hmm. of, of uh, the people here. So IPNC was always about having fun for those three days and, and uh, praying it wouldn't rain, but always knowing that, you know, it was gonna be the hottest days <laughs> of the year and um, how are you gonna deal with it? <laughs> and tell us about, so you got started working with Oregon State at that point as well. So tell me a little bit about your kind of work with Oregon State uh, during sort of your first run in Oregon and, and how you got uh, uh, tied up with them. Yeah, um, coming from an academic family, uh, uh, science was all sort of always in my uh, DNA, uh, even though I decided to become a psych major undergraduate and then ended up uh, in farming, um, which of course was a great disappoint to, disappointment to my uh, Asian parents, uh, but they learned to uh, appreciate it and actually were, were very supportive later on. Um, so the connection with Extension, as I uh, mentioned before, started at uh, UC Davis um, and then continued on Long Island and then just naturally got established here uh, with Barney, Steve, uh, um, Porter Lombard, and then uh, Ed Hellman, who arrived here as the uh, um, extension agent uh, who was based at the North Willamette uh, Research Station. And so it was just all about uh, going to technical meetings and um, uh, learning as much as we could about uh, not only uh, uh, the technical aspects of growing grace, but also the science behind it. Um, I think uh, while I was at THV, uh, we hosted two graduate students um, and their uh, research uh, projects. Um, uh, one key project that I mentioned earlier was that Winkler Sincerely came in and established this uh, very funky hanging uh, uh, trellis system where the, the vine was trained at uh, 50 inches off the ground on a one wire uh, trellis that had a stake at each vine and the canopy would hang down like an umbrella so the fruit zone would be on the top and so uh, um, I would say even in the late 80s it wasn't necessarily to, uh, a certainty that vertical shoot positioning was the, going to be the dominant trellis system mm -hmm. in Oregon. There are many many different hybrids uh, but there were 600 acres of this Winkwist and Sealy trellis and, and it was making some pretty good wine at Seven Springs and Temperance Hill and Freedom Hill and other places. So uh, the winemakers hated it, by the way. They, they, all, they all went to Burgundy, saw VSP and said, this is, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> but so we had Steve and Barney run, uh, I think they ran three years of, of trials on uh, VSP, uh, excuse me, on the hanging system that we had, uh, by the way, which costs um, probably uh, half as much money to not only develop vineyards but also to farm it afterwards um, because it re just it didn't require uh, shoot positioning or um, or wire lifting um, and the results of their experiments showed that uh, basically there was no no fruit chemistry difference uh, between the two systems other than the phenolics were a little bit higher on the hanging system because 
the grapes tended to sit on the shoulder of the vine and be more exposed to the sun, especially in, in warmer years. Mm -hmm. So as we go into climate change and we see, see um, things uh, changing around us, um, this is really, uh, this may be uh, uh, an important bit of information. Um, which speaking of climate change, I'll just digress uh, a second here. Um, when, when I was here in the 80s and 90s, um, viticulturally, the wine industry in the Willamette Valley had uh, uh, one primary goal, and that was to enhance the, uh, um, the uniformity and consistency of, of Pinot Noir ripening. And we would do anything possible to harvest the grapes before the fall rains mm -hmm. came. And so there was a lot of talk about um, smaller vines, uh, packed closer together on a lower fruiting wire. And you see examples of that everywhere from DDO to, um, uh, um, to soda and, and lots of different wineries. And so that was an effort to speed up the ricing process, make it more uh, synchronous, and get the fruit off before the, the rains and birds came. Um, now, uh, 25 years later when I come back, um, it's almost the exact opposite. It's like, where, how are we going to extend the season into the cooler part of the autumn so we can get some cool weather on these grapes to bring everything into balance? And so at OSU, we planted a trellis trial uh, where we're experimenting with different spreads of VSP to provide more shade. Um, uh, there are many other ideas, such as turning uh, vine rows and things of that nature, of course, elevation, but um, for all you climate doubters out there, you know, all you have to do is talk to a farmer and they'll tell you what, what's going on with the climate because they live the climate uh, uh, basically every waking hour of, of every day, you know, they uh, are farming. And, uh, and there's nobody in the world who's more sensitive to climate than, uh, than a farmer. Uh, and so we know uh, what, what's going on out there. Uh, and we see trends and patterns uh, uh, and identify with those and uh, 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 adapt to them. So, and clearly OSU will be a part of that adaptation uh, um, process. So, uh, yeah, I was always involved with OSU. I uh, w was on the search committee for CARMO, um, was uh, part on the committee that uh, helped to uh, bring the Woodhall uh, Vineyard from the Baines family uh, into OSU as the, as the um, research vineyard, um, served on the uh, uh, Oregon Wine Grow Association Research Committee for, uh, uh, for many years mm -hmm. when there wasn't much money, but there was just Steve and Barney and Porter um, uh, doing the research and, and handing out those funds. But um, just in terms of a small shop being productive, um, I always felt that uh, um, they were as or more productive than, than the program at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of getting applied research into the hands of growers that could help us to make uh, better wine. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, they just have done a great job. You should definitely watch their archive uh, um, videos. Uh, so that was a very exciting period. Mm -hmm. It was a collaboration between the university and the industry. Um, uh, everybody was pretty clueless. Uh, when we had uh, basically no crop in 1987, uh, Steve um, did, quickly did a, applied research experiments and determined that uh, it was probably boron deficiency, boron deficiency induced by uh, um, drought during the fall se previous fall season. Uh, so that led to the regular practice of, uh, um, of uh, applying boron uh, in the spring. Now I think people think it might have been something else, like rust mites maybe, but at that time, uh, um, it, um, the boron amendment, amendment seemed to address the problem. But that, that was a classic example of how you have a very specific issue um, like boron deficiency or now uh, a smoke impact and uh, red blotch, grapevine red blotch virus, uh, and how uh, the uh, land grant university can respond um, uh, to, these, uh, uh, to these immediate needs. So um, 
and we had this great synergy between Linfield and Chemeketa and OSU, and, and, but OSU can, has the ability to respond with resor research resources to address um, uh, immediate uh, mm -hmm. problems for the industry. Did you find that at, at that time that a lot of it was uh, Steve and Mark and you, or Steve and you, sorry, <laughs> try that again. Did you find that at that time that it was you and Steve and Barney and Porter sort of driving research uh, and the growers responding to it? Or did you find that it was growers presenting problems and, and the research uh, kind of following up on it? I think it was really, that was the beauty of it. It was really uh, uh, two directions. Um, and, and that was beauty, and that was, uh, of course, the, that's sort of the ideal of the uh, research industry um, relationship that it would be uh, um, multi-directional. Um, and by the way, it wasn't me; it was really people like Ted Castile and David Adelsheim. Uh, you know, I was in the mix, but uh, they were certainly the uh, the leading um, uh, forces in uh, in the research area. But uh, so David Adelsheim bringing the Dijon clones over, for example, uh, um, and then Barney and Steve testing those uh, both in the vineyard and then uh, in the cellar. And pe uh, people often don't understand how difficult micro vinification is. So, and that continues today, where you're trying to test uh, something, replicated trials in, in very small amounts, and come up with. Uh, um, uh, results in terms of a wine that represents a commercially made wine so that the industry can sit down in front of a glass, taste the wine and say, aha, you know, I can see planting these clones and making this wine and trying to sell it. I mean, that is a huge, huge leap. And to be able to do that is an, an art and science actually beyond compare. And that Barney and now James Osborne continue to do practice this is uh, really a remarkable achievement on behalf of, of uh, this industry. So, and to have the Dijon clones uh, take hold and, um, and spread as they had not only across Oregon but across the uh, United States is, uh, is a remarkable achievement. Another good example is in terms of directional research is uh, Steve Price taking uh, research that was done in apples and um, and uh, other fruit uh, uh, fruit crops, and uh, developing a system of uh, crop prediction uh, based on the lag phase uh, or the physiology of the vine that would allow growers to estimate um, uh, um, yields at harvest. And this is really really important, uh, and it's just hard to imagine. Uh, with Pinot Noir, uh, less so with Chardonnay and Pinot Gris, but with Pinot Noir, uh, how important that was to us. For example, um, uh, the West Field at Temperance Hill might be considered our kind of Grand Cru field, and there were four wineries when I was there who got fruit from that uh, Ponzi, Evesham Wood, uh, Christum. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, Kristen, Steve Dorner wanted to know what was the what was the best yield to make the best wine. Mm -hmm. So I think over two years we did this experiment with him, and Steve is the most experimental winemaker I've ever known in the uh, uh, in the wine. You should definitely interview him if you haven't. Yeah. Um, so he made wines. We cropped the vines at different levels. Um, at least we thought they were different levels, four tons, three tons, two tons, and one ton per acre equivalent. So Steve makes the wine, we go next spring and taste, and um, we're sniffing and swirling. Four tons is kind of rosé, mm, no, can't do this. Three tons, decent wine, you know, but not the wine you're looking for premium Oregon Pinot Noir. Two tons, you know, that's nailed it, kind of, that's what we want. One ton, and if you're, you know, if you believe in this sort of reductionist uh, theory of yield and quality, then you, you think one ton is, is, is great. But one ton, the, the wine went to some weird kind of uh, dense, jammy, uh, concentrated Syrah-like thing. So, so Steve said, okay, two tons is our target. So yes, two tons. We got to get two tons for Christum and the other guys. And then they figured, they, we were told, well, you can err 500 pounds on either side of 2,000 pounds per acre. 
So, you know, we had a, about a, a, a thousand pound uh, range there, mm -hmm. but hitting that target um, was really, really important to us and having lag phase crop estimation allowed us to have at least some assurance other than sh shooting completely by the hip and visually looking at a vine as so many growers say they can and I think some experienced growers can and say, oh yeah, yeah, X number of tons or pounds per vine. Um, but uh, so that was a system, not that it was always perfect. I mean, there were years where, I mean, I personally shot for plus or minus 5% on crop estimates um, uh, based on the um, statistical uh, um, target. Uh, I've been off by as much as 50% uh, um, in, in, in strange years that I think nobody could explain, and those do happen. But, but Steve developed that practice that has become pretty much adopted uh, universally around the wine industry in the, in the world as, as a way mm -hmm. of statistically assessing uh, um, yields uh, for uh, quality. So when you think about um, uh, contributions to fine wine around the world, uh, this is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, another one would be Scott Henry, the genius uh, in Roseburg and the Umpqua Valley developing his uh, trellis system. And oh, here's another good story of of a winemaker who, who used psychology and common sense to, make, uh, to help him make better wine. So this was David Adelsheim. So at, at, um, when I was at Temperance Hill, we had 25 acres of clone uh, 108 Chardonnay. And David was probably one of our biggest buyers. And David realized that clone 108 was probably not the best clone for Oregon. It was too high acid. Um, and uh, he realized that in order to get, uh, to get flavors to where he wanted and, and hopefully get the acidity down some, he had to let the grapes hang. So we had 100 acres of, of grapes at Temperance Hill. And among those 100 acres, I would say we had 25 bird scaring devices that would keep the birds out um, during harvest, uh, uh, propane cannons mainly, and the uh, bird guard electronics walkers. Um, uh, and so by the end of the harvest, all the grapes would be picked except David's. There would be this little five section uh, uh, of Chardonnay, and we had all 25 um, cannons and squawkers in that five acres. It just, when you walked through there, it sounded like a war zone. And there were times uh, uh, when we picked his Chardonnay in November. Wow. Um, and so one time, I just couldn't take it anymore. The birds were killing us, the rain was killing us, the rot was killing us. So I just picked the grapes and I took them and I just drove them up to uh, quarter mile lane. And uh, Don Kautzner was there and David and um, they were not happy. And we had a big knockdown drag out fight on the uh, crush pad. Um, uh, so they took the grapes, I went away. In the spring, an invitation comes in the mail. Hey Mark. Ginny is cooking a wine country lunch. We're inviting all of our independent growers together and we're gonna taste Chardonnay. So David, um, we go up there, Ginny is wonderful and great cook and have a wonderful lunch. And we go into the winery cellar. There's a big long table with 15 wines on it for 15 different growers. And um, so we taste all those wines blind and um, it's really, really easy. Even if you've never tasted a Chardonnay in your whole life, you know which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. You know, the unripe, acidic ones would just rip the enamel off your teeth. <laughs> and so David, you know, that's how he, he taught us. He said, you know, I'm trying to make this wine so I can sell it, and this is the style of wine I want to make. Uh, this is the wine we're making right now from Temperance Hill, and this is not the wine I want to make. So how are we going to get from there to there? So we work out a deal. Um, he's going to pay me more for the grapes, so we can let him hang. Uh, but he has 100% privilege on calling the harvest date. And uh, I will defend to the death uh, from birds and rain and rot uh, that fruit, but it's his call on, on when we pick it. And that's how you, and, and he, he conceded to an acreage contract so we wouldn't lose our shirts mm -hmm. by losing all the grapes to the birds and, and disease. Mm -hmm. And that's how growers and winemakers work together to make great wine. And I, to this day, I just congratulate David for not saying, Mark, you're full of 
full of crap and I'm never going to buy grapes from you again. He took the time to teach me. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, whenever David came to the vineyard, I would make sure I was there and I'd walk through the, gra the, through the vines with him, taste fruit with him, and, and hang on his every word about uh, how he was assessing uh, great quality. Uh, so that was an uh, important lesson uh, for me. I'm not sure how we got onto that, but <laughs> these are all of my stories about how I figured out how to be a wine grower. And, um, and uh, there was no book about this. It was just, you know, you learn from people who are smarter than you and you all have the same goal. You're trying to make the best wine possible. So uh, that all got, to, uh, got me to where I am. Sure. So at that point, uh, at some point here, you decide you're going to leave Oregon and, and head, you said, head back to the head back to the Mid-Atlantic. So what precipitated that? What precipitated you heading to, to Penn State next? Um, well, I loved extension. And basically, for those of you who were here in the 90s, it basically rained for an entire decade. <laughs> and I'll be honest, uh, I don't know why. I guess I'm just, not, I mean, we always made fun of California winemakers who would come up here uh, work for one or two harvests and then skedaddle back to California because they couldn't take the weather. Uh, the one great exception to that is Lynn Penarash. Lynn, Lynn at uh, Rex Hill was just tenacious and she stuck it out and she became a, a great, great winemaker. Um, uh, but I don't know, I guess I got tired of the moss growing on my <laughs> ankles and uh, just looked for... Uh, um, and be being at heart in Eastern or New England, or just thought, well, let's go uh, go back and give this extension thing a try at Penn State. So, went back there, and and to be quite honest, there were issues happening in Oregon, uh, labor issues, uh, regulation issues. Um, uh, um, I'll be perfectly honest and say I was uh, I was afraid that uh, um, who would have been present in that time? Maybe it was George. No, it wasn't W. I can't remember, but uh, that they would, uh, they would uh, mandate the E-Verify system and that we would lose all of our labor. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I just didn't want to be around when that happened, so I think I started looking for other things. So, also, the industry was, was maturing. Money was starting to come in, mm -hmm. and I could see the complexion of the industry beginning to change with money arriving, mm -hmm. and that the kind of homey, chummy, uh, feeling that we had through the 80s and 90s uh, was beginning to um, not go away, but uh, just change in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and I love the adventure of new regions, so Pennsylvania, uh, what could be more bizarre than that? Uh, although I will say that the first commercial vineyard in the United States of America, recognized commercial vineyard, was on the Schuylkill River outside of Philadelphia in uh, 1684. <laughs> So there's a lot more history in Pennsylvania than there is anywhere on the West Coast when it comes to viticulture. Uh, so I went back and did 15 years of, of really just uh, tremendously interesting uh, um, wine growing uh, with equally brilliant people um, in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, uh, from Nova Scotia and Ontario down to uh, um, North Carolina and Georgia. Uh, just uh, a f fascinating wine area um, and also some pretty nice Pinot Noirs being produced there. Mm -hmm. Took a lot of my knowledge back there, told them how to build an industry, uh, did an Eastern Pinot Noir conference uh, like Steamboat uh, and, and in the Finger Lakes and tried to um, just tried to help out there. At the same time continued to be involved, got involved with a lot of USDA stuff like um, creating uh, the uh, National Grape and Wine Initiative, which is now the National Grape, uh, wine, Al Grape and wine Alliance, or, or National Wine Research Alliance, uh, um, and uh, the Clean Plant Network, which grew out of uh, our regional lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C., uh, and then was, um, I'll just use the word, sorry, Eric, politely hijacked <laughs> by the federal government <laughs> and made into a national program. Um, that was fine. That's the way it goes. And then the National Viticulture and Extension, uh, Viticulture and Knowledge Extension Leadership Conference, which was really started, uh, that was Ed uh, Hellman's brainchild, uh, and then being uh, a par original participant in 
the uh, development of that. And speaking of Ed Hellman, I have to call out Ed because he developed the um, uh, Northwest uh, uh, Grape and Berry uh, InfoNet, which Ed was so far ahead of the curve of anybody in internet technology at a time. Most of us were just trying to get used to putting .edu or .org or .com at the end of, a, of an address. But Ed was out there much, and nobody knew about this, learning HTML and building a website from the ground up and uh, getting, uh, he had this incredible vision of, of how the internet could help uh, the wine industry. Mm -hmm. And, um, and basically, I copied him at Penn State. Of course, everybody else since has copied him. But uh, um, congratulations to Ed for uh, understanding the potential uh, of the internet to spread knowledge uh, um, within an industry and around the world. Sure. Uh, so I stayed at, for 15 years at Penn, uh, Penn State. And then um, we decided we wanted to move back to Oregon. So if something came up, and so. Uh, the Oregon Wine Research Institute came up, and so we moved back here in uh, um, 2014. And uh, now I'm the program coordinator there. Sure. <laughs> so before we go back to Oregon, let's talk about Pennsylvania a little bit. I'm curious oh. what your impressions were. You talked about being a growing wine region, and, and, and you, had a, you had a pretty big geographical spread that you were working with. So what were your impressions after having kind of cut your teeth in Oregon of these other wine growing regions and what they had to learn from Oregon and, and maybe what Oregon had to learn from, from them? Oh uh, yeah, that's so good. That's such a good question. And I wish the transfer of knowledge between these regions were uh, greater as, as well as the respect and ag acknowledgement. So, so I moved back to Pennsylvania. I was kind of a confirmed, you know, vinifera wine snob with uh, Pinot Noir. Um, but then all of a sudden I was immersed in this uh, world of, uh, of native rye, Niagara, Concord, Delaware, Steuben, uh, hybrids, uh, Cayuga, Vidal Blanc, Chamberson, Baco Noir, Marichal Foch. Uh, and it's like, whoa, what is going on here? And then a little bit of vinifera. The vinifera thing was kind of just getting started. Um, and, um, but my epiphany was, uh, so I went to uh, a winery called Nisley uh, for a summer festival evening, and there was like uh, maybe a thousand people there listening to jazz and, and sipping wine out on their lawn. And they were mostly young people, I would say in, between, in 20s to 40s. And they were all drinking, almost uniformly, they were drinking uh, kind of sweet, hybrid, native red wines uh, with whatever food they were eating. And they were having just the greatest time of their lives. And, and that was my epiphany, say, you know, sorry, you don't need to drink $50 Oregon Pinot to have the greatest time of your life. <laughs> you can drink $10 Catawba and still have the greatest time of your life. It's just all relative and nobody should ever tell anyone uh, what they should drink, why, how, when, where, anything. Wine is wine, and if it contributes to that convivial feeling uh, um, among your family and friends, then, then that wine has served its purpose, whether it's two buck chuck or, um, you know, hundred dollar Oregon Pinot. Uh, so that was my um, moment of realization, and while my focus was on uh, improving wine quality for uh, um, vinifera, uh, certainly gained a healthy appreciation for natives and, um, and uh, hybrids. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, came to believe two important things. One, that the best wine growers in the world um, are in uh, Eastern and West, Midwestern North America. Um, why? Uh, um, not because, not necessarily by choice, but um, they deal with the most difficult uh, grape growing conditions uh, in, uh, on the planet. So my introduction to that was the year I arrived, 1999. Uh, uh, first, first harvest there, Hurricane Hugo blows up the eastern seaboard, uh, drops 10 inches of rain um, in one day on southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, 2011, uh, Hurricane uh, I, I, Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee, dropped 40 inches of rain 
on the East Mid-Atlantic, Eastern United States, in uh, four weeks. And, um, and then in 2012, next year, uh, Hurricane Sandy drops uh, uh, about 20 inches of rain on us. So, I mean, how do you make great wine uh, under those conditions? Um, there's a level of resilience, uh, uh, creativity, uh, technology, knowledge, um, sheer intensity and passion and humility and all those that need to be combined uh, um, if you're going to uh, survive under those conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, uh, I wouldn't expect any winemaker in Oregon or California to, or Washington to understand. And maybe, and many will just say, well, you know, they, nobody's forcing them to <laughs> grow wine there, and you're absolutely right. But, um, uh, but if you talk to some of the wine growers that I worked with there and ask them uh, about their terroir, they understand their terroir even better than the Burgundians and the Alsatians. Mm -hmm. um, because they are under harsher conditions and they need to react to their terroir in an intelligent way um, under certain conditions. And it also gives them a greater appreciation when they do have a great vintage. Mm -hmm. And it was the same way here in the 80s and 90s because we were having a lot of crappy vintage. So when we had the 1987 or 94, uh, you really, really appreciate it. That's something that um, climate change uh, wine growers cannot understand. <laughs> uh, yes, you had 11 and 13, um, but uh, five inches of rain, I just kind of roll my eyes. Uh, um, uh, but I'm not being sarcastic or sardonic about this, uh, you know. Uh, again, you, you pick uh, um, where you want to uh, um, grow your wine. Uh, I think the other thing that's really important is that they did learn to rely heavily on research and extension for knowledge back there, and, and that was a really important uh, um, uh, relationship uh, um, back east. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, don't underestimate the quality of a Finger Lakes Riesling, a Long Island Merlot, or a Virginia uh, a Bordeaux Red Blend. Um, these wines compete at the international level uh, very readily and easily. Uh, so it was a really good experience. It broadened my horizons, and that's what I think is, is, is why you go to New Zealand to work to crush. It's why you go to South Africa. It's why uh, you go to France or Germany. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, just because Asimov uh, doesn't write about uh, wines from Pennsylvania doesn't mean that there aren't uh, brilliant wines uh, there to um, mm -hmm. uh, um, be explored. Sure. So you mentioned kind of wanting to come back and, and finding this role at, at Oregon State at the Oregon Wine Research Institute. So tell us a little bit about the OWRI and, and how it got going and then how what your role is in it uh, and, and going forward. Oh, okay. It definitely got going before um, my Rival, so uh, so uh, you know we've talked a lot about Stephen Barney and Porter, but uh, um, so after I left in 2000, uh, um, this program, the industry continued to grow and the program continued to grow with it, not necessarily adding resources uh, like more viticulture extension or enology extension, but um, uh, collaborative efforts within different departments. And of course, we were blessed with the good fortune of having that USDA um, ARS horticulture uh, uh, unit in Corvallis. So there were these dozen or so scientists who were all working on grape-related issues, but off in their own silos. So again, visionary people like David Adelsheim uh, took a look, and Ted Castile took a look at this and said, hey, we have these people, uh, they're all working for us with, on grapes and wine, but let's make sure that they know what each other is doing and that they work as collaboratively as possible. So I think the original idea was to form a viticulture enology department uh, a la UC Davis. Mm -hmm. um, so they took this idea to the College of Agricultural Sciences and it was uh, Sonny Ramaswamy with the dean at the time said, uh, no, you know, you, you, you just don't have enough critical mass to justify this and, and uh, you know, I guess I probably would have agreed with him. So they decided to uh, form a virtual institute within the college uh, that would uh, foster 
uh, collaboration among these uh, various uh, faculty in different departments. Um, uh, so in order to do this, the industry passed the hat around and through many, many twenty-five and fifty thousand dollar donations, they raised uh, two million dollars as seed money for OWRI. Uh, so it was decided that uh, um, that a director would be hired and an assistant, and that uh, uh, that these faculty working on grapes and wine would uh, fall under this OWRI umbrella. Uh, they were still wedded to their departments, but uh, they would also uh, be in the institute. And so um, Neil Shea was hired um, as a director uh, from the University of Florida, and he guided the institute uh, through its first couple of years. Um, and I think that was just kind of, you know, how is this going to work? Uh, how, you know, uh, it was kind of all just this formative period. Um, and then for reasons that even uh, maybe I don't really understand to this day, uh, Neil decided to leave. He's still um, very active in the Department of Food Science and Technology at OSU. Uh, and then there was this interim period where Bill Bogus, the uh, executive mm -hmm. uh, associate dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences, uh, um, led the institute. And Danielle Gabriel, uh, who was Neil's assistant, essentially took over the day-to-day -day management and just did an incredible job. Uh, without a background in, in, you know, uh, or history with the wine industry. Uh, well, she was a biology, uh, um, forestry, maybe wildlife uh, major. So she definitely had uh, uh, a science wherewithal. Mm -hmm. So she led for two years. And then uh, the industry went back to the drawing board and uh, came up with this uh, new model for the Institute. Instead of having top-down director uh, hierarchy to do a bottom-up in which the, uh, what are called the core faculty uh, the ten members at that time uh, in these different departments would form essentially a management committee uh, to guide a program coordinator uh, who was to uh, 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 sort of enable uh, the faculty in their uh, research program. So uh, that's when um, a search went on and I was, I was hired in, in 2014. And so we've been working under that model um, for uh, um, since I've been there. and. It took me a while to uh, 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 grasp it. Um, as you know, management by committee can always be challenging, but I say for the most part, we've learned to make it work. And, uh, and Bill is always there as the, um, uh, in his uh, uh, um, supervisory capacity. So, um, and uh, we've sort of fostered our relationships with the industry um, and built those to be very strong. And, mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think we continue to seek from the industry to understand what their issues are uh, um, through the Oregon Wine Standing, uh, Oregon Wine Industry Standing Committee for Research, OWISCR, uh, which is the interface between the, or the research interface between uh, the Oregon Wine Board uh, and its, uh, uh, and, and um, I'll just say not necessarily just OWRI, but um, all uh, research mm -hmm. uh, partners uh, in Oregon. So uh, through OWISCR, people from industry, Oregon Wine Board, and OSU and others get together a few times a year and talk about what are the issues, uh, talk about the uh, request for applications or the priorities of the industry for research. Um, and just sort of form that uh, formal relationship and structure uh, between the industry and um, their academic partners. Sure. Uh, so this continues to grow and evolve and um, uh, the exciting piece was there was always a mandate for a third stool on, on a third leg on the research stool of uh, economics and business research and we finally got that stuck on in, the, in 2016 and so now the Department of Applied Economics at OSU uh, is very much uh, involved in um, uh, research in the form of uh, Dr. James Stearns and uh, 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 Dr. Nadia Strelitskaya, who is a um, uh, 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 behavioral econo economist, which uh, I really hadn't known much about uh, um, uh, economics and behavior, but boy, are they connected, and boy, do they, are they at work in the wine business. <laughs> so uh, she's an incredible uh, resource having done her 
PhD research at Cornell with wine uh, in behavior, uh, behavioral economics. So um, I, I'm really, really excited about this uh, uh, new branch of research uh, that we have uh, um, at OWRI. So. Uh, we just so we have 11 core faculty. We have um, five or six associate faculty who um, work with our core faculty. Uh, we have uh, a research extension faculty in the field: Clive Kaiser in Walla Walla, uh, Steve Rehnquist in the Umpqua Valley. Uh, um, well, Alex Levin in Southern Oregon is one of our core faculty, but he acts as an almost an extension faculty down there. Uh, with Rick Hilton in entomology and Achala KC in, in plant pathology. So uh, we, we really do have uh, resources spread around. Oh, and pardon me, Ashley Thompson uh, in the Columbia Gorge. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, the Willamette Valley continues to be the 800 pound gorilla, but these other wine regions, and I go back to my comment about uh, where is it most exciting to be uh, making wine, and if you go uh, these other wine regions, while well, Southern Oregon has matured a lot uh, um, uh, since, I, since my first tour here, but if you go to the Columbia Gorge and Walla Walla, it's kind of like the Wild West. And uh, if you want adventure and discovery, uh, those are the places to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so much fun to see the, uh, uh, see the uh, gleam of light in the eyes of the uh, of the wine industry people there because they know they're on this big adventure to make great wine. Sure. And they're they're figuring out their terroir and to the extent that we can help them, um, we're gonna um, uh, put in our two cents into that whole process. Sure. Uh, you were just in the news recently for some of the research you're doing on some of the current issues uh, afflicting the industry. So tell us a little bit about uh, work with Red Blotch and, and Smoke Taint as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, semantics again uh, uh, coming into play here, uh, just like c calling vintage is challenging. We, we've been told not to use the word smoke taint, okay, because <laughs> uh, that has negative uh, connotations, of course. So, smoke impact or smoke effects. Um, uh, but, need needless to say, these are problems that, you know, again, uh, um, I think it wouldn't be too far a stretch to say that both are climate change related. Mm -hmm. uh, drought, uh, st vine stress, uh, um, uh, stress of the um, uh, general ecology. Uh, so what, what happens then, of course, you get uh, smoke uh, affecting wine quality. In one case, is a winemaker told me that uh, in 20, uh, as a result of the uh, fires in the Columbia Gorge, uh, he had to discard uh, 75 out of 100 barrels of Pinot Noir. Mm. So that's the real, uh, that's the rubber hits the road effect. Um, uh, um, so, you know, what do we do about it? What can we do about it? So we formed a smoke taint, uh, uh, smoke impact team of uh, um, uh, Patty Skinkus, Viticulture, Alex Levin, Viticulture. Um, uh, James Osborne, Enology, uh, Elizabeth Tomasino, Sensory uh, Enology, Michael uh, Chen, uh, um, uh, um, Flavor and uh, Aroma uh, um, Chemistry. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they are joining forces with uh, um, researchers from University of British Columbia, Washington State University, uh, UC Davis, uh, um, uh, to address this problem. It's, it's unbelievably complicated, unbelievably complicated. Uh, so at, at so many levels from, uh, from the molecular mm -hmm. to um, a wine bottle on a shelf. It's unbelievably, everything is intertwined. It's very, very complex. So we're just trying to get a grip on that. Red Blot shows up in 2012. All of a sudden, um, all these vineyards that uh, we thought had leaf roll or something close to it, and we didn't know what it was, you know, then it's red blotch, and it's uh, from Southern California um, all the way up to the Willamette Valley, probably Washington also. And it turns out that this is a disease uh, virus that's really, really hard to pin down. We're trying to understand the epidemiology. Uh, the vectors, uh, the um, modes of transmission, uh, the, the physiology, uh, um, 
uh, it's been enormously uh, uh, challenging. Uh, we got a, a large grant a gift from a, a, a winery to accelerate our research and that's been enormously helpful. I think it shows the extent that the uh, wine industry uh, is concerned about the problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we're working, we, again, we formed a team, a multidisciplinary, uh, um, multi-regional team. So the research goes on in Southern Oregon, all the way up to here in the Willamette Valley, Washington State University, Berkeley, uh, UC Davis, Cornell. Uh, everybody is kind of uh, uh, chasing this virus, trying to understand it and, and uh, come up with uh, um, management Rec recommendations mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, for growers because vines are being removed and and when vines are removed you know that you have a problem that's uh, um, that uh, is is quite serious um, and uh, and southern Oregon is taking the brunt of a lot of this the smoke and the um, and the red blotch and we really really need to um, be um, in tune and be um, uh, uh, sensitive to their uh, to their needs uh, down there so I think um, uh, yeah we're trying to uh, uh, help in in any way we can and of course that all got complicated by this whole situation with the California winery mm -hmm. and uh, and so again you know if you want to understand where the economic rubber hits the road when it comes to growing grapes um, that's that's a great example, and um, and science is part of the solution, and I think the industry realizes that um, we're a um, uh, not disinterested third party, but certainly a neutral third party in being able to provide uh, um, science-generated um, uh, um, information, technology, new knowledge uh, to apply to any problem or situation mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, you know that's um, what it's all about when you're trying to figure out sustainable solutions to some of these really seemingly chronic and intractable problems uh, so that's pretty much what we do and we work as closely with the wine industry as we can uh, they call us all the time and that's fine um, and uh, progress on research is not as fast as anybody wants it to be <laughs> but there's a system to it uh, there's a scientific method and um, and the industry is um, is working with us. Uh, one thing we did recently, and I would encourage everybody in the industry to uh, consider this, is uh, um, the Vitic the the Willamette Valley uh, Viticulture Technical and Enology Groups got together to host an event in November called Adopt a Researcher. Um, yeah, it sounds a little strange, but it was just a great day where. Um, 50 or 60 industry people came to OSU. Uh, each of our faculty set up a 20 minute module, teaching module to explain to them what they did in their research and what impact it was having for the growers. And I'll tell you, uh, it was a vibe that I think I've never experienced before in a, in a research industry setting. Uh, and, and it's not just learning about the technology, but it's meeting the people and seeing where they work mm -hmm. and how hard they work mm -hmm. and what they're what all this effort is going towards and it was just a terrific synergy and um, when you see that kind of uh, uh, um, energy that uh, um, comes out of uh, the enhancement of knowledge uh, it really is exciting and you realize what the potential may be for continuing to improve Oregon wines mm -hmm. so we just did a vision thing. The, the industry just did the research retreat in um, uh, November. Uh, we did uh, six listening sessions around the state, uh, going to each major region and getting growers and winemakers in the room and saying, hey, what, you know, what are your issues and how can we address them? And then, then about 25 or 30 of the most uh, uh, um, serious research and education advocates from the industry got together in Newburgh and for two days and out of that popped uh, uh, all kinds of outcomes that are going to be unveiled at the Oregon Wine Symposium in, in uh, February. 
And so it'll be very, very important for us to see what popped out of that and how we can merge our own strategic planning mm -hmm. with the vision of what the industry has for its goals for um, uh, wine quality, improvement, sustainability um, uh, in Oregon. Uh, the first time that was done in 1991 with a two-day meeting at, at, St at Silver Falls, that was kind of a legendary meeting where um, the, this kind of same type of leaders got together and hold up and uh, beat each other up mentally, uh, um, trying to figure out where we wanted to take this industry. And to some extent, you know, that was kind of the launching pad for what you see today. Mm -hmm. And that can be done intentionally. It doesn't have to be all dumb luck and, and stumbling and, uh, yeah, oh, I happen to make a great wine. Can I do it again? Sure. Uh, it can be really process oriented. And so you try and identify in, um, those areas where you can um, make progress and, and um, focus on those. Sure. So we'll see what happens after. So since 1991, yeah, 20. Was that 25 years? 28 years now. Yeah, 28 years. So yeah, check back in 28 years. <laughs> See, I, I, um, that's my big thing is the vision thing. And so here's another one of my events. And sorry for all these stories. I'm no, it's one what we're here for. My time. Um, so when I was deciding whether to come back here, um, uh, the Oregon, the Willamette Valley Wine Growers or Willamette Valley Winery Association has this road show where they send uh, um, these kind of uh, posses of, of, of winemakers around the country to taste wines. And so there was an event in Washington, D.C. I couldn't make it, but two of my best extension wine nerdy uh, friends from Maryland and New Jersey went. And they tasted the wines, 50 P or, uh, Oregon Pinots. And of course, then the next day they wrote to me and said, okay, Mark, well, you know, we went there, we tasted 50 Pinots, they were all great. Uh, Oregon has arrived, you know, it's all settled. You know, you kind of just, you're a great Pinot wine region. <laughs> and that's great, you know. This was validation from two very trusted uh, um, friends and mm -hmm. who knew a lot about wine. And I thought, okay, but you know, what is that? What does that really mean? I mean, to have arrived, uh, and is that a, if you've arrived, is that even a good place to be? Um, and so I got to thinking, no, nah, this is not good. Um, you know, does, are are they telling me that we've made our best wine and that there's really no place to go from here? And I can't believe for a second that that's true. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I know any winemaker, even a not so good winemaker well, more likely a not so good winemaker, who would say that they've made their best wine that they're ever gonna make. Mm -hmm. Every winemaker thinks they're gonna make a better wine, but what is that in Oregon? What's a, what's a better Pinot from what we already have? Mm -hmm. And um, so I asked myself that question. I've asked many, many really smart winemakers that question, and I'll have to say that's still very, very much in the air. And um, of course it can, it boils down, the answers are mostly, ah, oh, yeah, you, you know, this terroir thing or, or this little thing or managing sulfur or cold soak better or um, you know figuring out nutrition or understanding the soil biome and, and, and things like that and yeah those are all important but can we formulate that even quantify it uh, integrate it into a some kind of uh, intelligent, intentional program that actually seeks to make um, a better wine, mm -hmm. or maybe even define what a better Oregon Pinot is and then work towards that. Um, or is it, have we done, did we do all that in the 80s and 90s and then it's just a matter of refinement, which in, in a, a kind of the nano level. And if that's the case, that's fine. I mean, maybe that's, that's the only uh, way we can go, but um, I think, you know, we need, we need to have this conversation. I don't think we necessarily did at that November meeting, uh, even though we did try and do what our facilitator, uh, um, Jessica Mosaico said was be aspirational in our um, thinking and objectives. Uh, so, um, and not just react to climate change, which is the danger. Um, uh, it's necessary, but it can't be the only thing. So um, we have to see where we can go with, um, with uh, um, the future of Oregon wine. Sure. And I was actually just, just going to ask you about that. As you look at the future of the OWRI specifically and of your work in the next five, ten years, 
do you see yourself more as reacting to issues as they arise or do you see yourself as more pushing uh, pushing things forward or is it is it trying to find a balance of, of those two um, it will always be reacting so whether it's brown marmorated stink bug or rust mites or spotted winged drosophila or smoke or or powdery mildew resistance or red blotch or <laughs> god knows what is going to happen next it's always reacting but that's not to say that um, just for example that we shouldn't have a genomic vision for what can happen uh, in um, international uh, um, wine production and that uh, Laurent Deluc uh, in his lab working with microvine technology uh, can't come up with uh, classically induced uh, genetic improvements in grapevines that will um, reduce the need uh, off-farm inputs as we call them pesticides maybe even nutrients uh, mm -hmm. by X amount and and just make immeasurable uh, improvements in environmental and human health potential. Uh, you know, if you think in those terms, then then the sky's the limit. You know, that's the that's the conversation. Uh, sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room with the wine global wine industry is. Uh, and I, I, the French were here last summer talking of, uh, from on top, uh, talking and Inra talking about um, you know their genetics uh, research and and we have so much now at our disposal in terms of technology can we use it wisely mm -hmm. uh, maintain the integrity of the product yet um, also uh, well quite honestly uh, save the environment at the same time I think that's you know what kind of we're asking as well as every other industry mm -hmm. uh, um, in the world my little pet project is because of my eastern experience is understanding the value of hybrids and that um, that uh, there are grapes that are referred to as no spray grapes and if you can believe that there are grapes that uh, are in our uh, collections um, uh, that um, well d I'll just put it this way from the other side vinifera is is the wimpiest of all grapes and requires the most TLC in order to grow mm -hmm. so all this stuff about biodynamics and organics and conventional and stuff like that it's all way 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 uh, above what um, if we if if we were to um, change our uh, approach to wine to accommodate the vastness of our of our global knowledge mm -hmm. uh, not just what we're doing in a, in a micro scale in our one little place where we had these concerns um, but to take existing hybrids and, um, and turn them into beautiful wines that, to be quite honest, 95% uh, of the wine drinkers in the world would absolutely uh, enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, because for them, like those people at Nisley Winery who are sitting around uh, uh, listening to music and drinking Concord and Niagara, they, they don't care necessarily what the grape was mm -hmm. they just want something that will help them to have a nice time with their friend, friends sure. and family and so that's not going to change all the pinot snobs those people that small percent of, of the um, pyramid will always need um, lots of inputs labor and and, and materials and chemicals um, uh, but uh, um, for the rest of the people and I um, not saying this in a condescending way in the very least in fact the opposite uh, um, are perfectly happy with a wine that never needed to be sprayed mm -hmm. and why don't we do that why don't we save the world that way um, uh, just like they've realized in corporate agri-farming in california that if they can reduce nitrogen inputs by even a fraction of a percent would have a greater impact than if you converted all the vineyards in California into organic or biodynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, look at everything in a global sense and figure out where you can have the most impact and then get busy doing that. Um, so there will always, always be people who have to do one thing a certain way and that's fine. But for 
since everything in the universe, in my mind, exists on a bell curve, um, try and help as many people on the hump to get to the front of the curve as you possibly can. And if you can drive a portion of that population to the front, um, where they become leaders and have become the most visionary, have the least impact uh, on the environment, and become the most sustainable um, people, organizations, industries in the world, then, then you start seeing some change in the condition of the planet. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm on my soapbox here, big time. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is your pulpit here. You talk about what you want to so, talk about. Okay, I better stop talking, because uh, who knows where, where this can go. <laughs> so, just one last question for you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, God. You're doing great. I have one last question for you, and okay. we'll, we'll wrap it up here. So it's, it's a big one, but it, uh, you've talked about it a bit already. But as you look at the future of the Oregon wine industry, as you look at it in the next five, ten years, what do you foresee happening at a, like a, a global scale for the, for the industry as a whole? Oh. Well, it's still, you know, very, very small in global terms, though, and that's good. You know, you're, you, you punch above your weight, uh, um, and Oregon has always done that uh, incredibly well. Um, but, but, you know, the landscape is changing. So we've got California moving up here. We've got, you know, copper cane situations. We've got uh, all kinds of stuff. We have A to Z uh, and bigger players, uh, mm -hmm. homegrown, coming in. So it's not just this uh, mom and pop dynamic anymore. And we've got big money coming in. So uh, how all this is going to